We're so excited to ground ourselves with Noguchi today. So thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. We've been, we're doing the same thing. You know, we're trying to find ways to stay engaged ourselves and keep people engaged and trying to figure out how to take the museum online without betraying its roots. Yeah. You know, oh, well said. Our, our place is really a testament to empirical thinking. So the whole idea of turning it into a kind of digital clearinghouse um, is weird. Yeah, yeah. It won't be forever though. Won't be forever. Though we're, we're spending a lot of time too, just as I'm sure you all are thinking, sort of rethinking the operating model. You know, what does the museum look like when it reopens? How do we function? We won't have a cafe. We're going to prop all the doors open. We're trying to go 100% non-touch. We've never time ticketed. We're going to time ticket. Um, you have a very limited number of people in the building at any given time. All, all of those things. It's very strange. Also, we don't have wall labels. Um, we have walk around guides that are yeah. laminated that you yeah. pick up out of a, you know, so we're obviously those don't work. So we're trying to figure out how to make it possible to have the place look like itself, but accommodate the desire not to, to have anybody touching anything. Yeah, I understand. Well, it looks like we've got some folks here. Um, we don't officially start for four more minutes, but I just wanted to say good morning to everyone. I see some of our, our best friends, our docents, our volunteers, our members here, um, and you guys all already know the drill. So mute yourself and turn off your video before we begin. Uh, familiarize yourself with chat um, and just say hello and let us know you're here. Introduce yourself and uh, tell us who your favorite artist is. Good morning, Heather and Anne, how are you? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I'm well, I really missed you Monday. I, oh, I missed you. And went up to see my sister in Virginia. Wonderful. In the country and are really isolated, so we had a, a nice family break. I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Me too. I always look forward to seeing you. So um, Dakin, I do a meditation session on um, Monday mornings at 11. The very first one we did, we did um, digitally, we did it in the Noguchi Gallery. Um, and Bobby has been there for every single one of them. And I always look for her voice on chat <laughs> and she wasn't there this Monday. I'm glad you were doing something wonderful, Bobby. It was a much needed mental recharge. Yeah, that's great. So do you guys all know where chat is? I'm gonna type in, hi. Um, I'm gonna say today, I have a different favorite artist every day. Um, <laughs> but today our, um, our lesson plans online are focused on Faith Ringgold. So I'm gonna say my favorite artist is Faith Ringgold today. Um, so if you could just type in, yeah, just type in and um, say hello. And we'll get started in about two minutes. Now I will say to everyone who's here, there's another exciting museum virtual event happening tomorrow night, Thursday, um, the 18th. Anne will be live in the vault for Escape into the Vault. And she'll be focusing on mini ovens. Hey, John, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good to be here. We're glad you're here. We're asking everyone just to mute themselves and turn off their video and say hello in the chat box and tell us who your favorite artist is. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, see you later. <laughs> Bye. And by the way, I love the the trip to the vault with Anne. It's I'm looking best. forward to that. It's the best. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's get started. We have quite a few people here today. I'm going to move to the next slide. 
got all these little boxes on my screen. I bet you guys do too. And I just want to introduce Dakin. Dakin Hart is with us today. Um, we're so happy to have Dakin with us today. And he is the senior curator at the Noguchi Foundation and Garden Museum in Long Island, New York. He oversees the Noguchi Museum's exhibitions, collections, archives, public programming, and now I'm assuming digital programming. Um, and we are just so honored to have Dakin here to talk with us this morning. Thank you, Dakin, for being here. Thank you for having me. It's so a pleasure to be with you, whatever that means right now in <laughs> Zoom land. I know, it's so funny. Um, Dakin, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, what you do at the Noguchi Museum and then tell us a little bit about uh, Noguchi's life and legacy. Well, the museum is a kind of remarkable place because believe it or not, it's still the only museum in the United States founded by an artist to show his or her own work. So it's, it's not just a repository of objects. You know, now, now in this moment when being a museum has suddenly become such a charged enterprise, everybody is looking at it and questioning it and thinking about the way museums express power um, and the, the relationship, the proper relationship between a museum and its community, um, the various communities that it serves. Our place is really very peculiar because it expresses the vision of a single human being. Um, it doesn't in any way uh, represent the, it's not colonial in any sense. Um, you know, it is Noguchi's expression of what he called his own point of view or perspective. Noguchi really didn't believe in style. Um, as he said, he once said, I don't have very much faith in objects. Um, I believe a lot more deeply in space. But also he was really was a perspective artist. You know, he was about, he really was more of a philosopher than he was an artist. He has a point of view. He's trying to express his point of view in everything he did. Um, and the, the museum in a way is a kind of an ultimate expression because it's an index of all of the ideas that he pursued over a more than 60 year active career. Um, he really never stopped working from the time he was uh, in his teens uh, until he died in, in 1988. So he was born in 1904. Um, it's important to hit some of the, just the sort of the top line highlights because he, he did live an incredibly complicated life. His biography is, is awesomely complicated. Um, but he was born to a Scotch-Irish mother who was actually born and raised in Brooklyn, uh, went to Bryn Mawr, uh, incredibly well-educated, um, and his father was a traveling sort of itinerant boho Japanese poet um, who was in New York and was writing in English, was in fact the first Japanese born writer to publish uh, poetry and novels in English and also wrote a number of books about important Japanese artists, um, Hokusai, Hiroshige and others. Um, so his father was a, a sort of a famous bridge between East, East and West Many of the imagist poets, people like Ezra Pound, credited him with introducing haiku into the English language. So Noguchi had this model um, that his parents were not technically married because although they, they we think that they did marry, but um, their marriage was illegal at the time because uh, in New York State, when they married, uh, it was not legal for people of different races to legally marry. So their marriage was null and void. Um, Noguchi's father, again, was a sort of traveling poet, um, didn't stay anywhere for very long, um, and he was immediately gone. Um, Noguchi's mother eventually took Noguchi. Um, by the way, she had not named him. Um, she didn't want to name him because it, it was very important to her that his father name him. So he was just called Baby or Yo. Um, for the first three years of his life. So she followed his father back to Japan. Um, she spoke no Japanese, single woman, single American woman. Um, this is 1906 and a half. Um, and she, uh, she settled down. She started teaching English to expats of various kinds, British army officers, um, people like that. And um, she raised Noguchi there uh, through elementary school and then sent him back to, to the United States to go to high school in, of all places, Rolling Prairie, Indiana. So in addition to everything else, Noguchi's identity is incredibly layered. 
Um, we always call Noguchi the kaleidoscope. He was kind of a, a one person American mosaic. Um, but his whole life, he, after the, from the age 13, he considered himself a Hoosier, um, as well as a native born Californian, um, and then a transplanted New Yorker um, in a way like, like many of us now, uh, you know, moving from, from one thing to another. He never uh, graduated from college. He did one, not quite one year of pre-med at Columbia. Uh, by this time, his mother had moved back to the States. She came with his half-sister, um, Eilis, to New York. Um, and she really pushed him out of med school because she said he was destined for greater things. And by that, she meant being an artist of all, <laughs> of all things. So a mother who pushed, pushed her son out of medical school to become an artist so she really encouraged him to take art classes at a, a little art school down in the village um, called the Leonardo da Vinci School of Art, run by a, a, an Italian immigrant named Honorio Rotolo. And Noguchi proved instantly that he would just had it. He had this incredible facility. He was a prodigy um, as a sculptor. He could make a perfect bust of somebody, you know, a few months into to working as a sculptor. Um, and he did that for a time. Oh yeah, here we have a great image of him with his that awesome unruly mane of hair. Now looking at this, this is really interesting and great because so many of our photos of Noguchi like this with those intense piercing eyes, um, you can't see the one most important thing, which is that Noguchi had bright blue eyes. So he was never, you know, the, the core of Noguchi's personality and of his artistic ambition was this kind of self-created notion that he was an, a, a perfect outsider, that he never had a home, that he never really properly belonged to anywhere. And in his mind, rather than an impediment, he turned that into, because I don't really belong anywhere, I'm at home everywhere. So he really thought of himself as a citizen of the earth. And um, from the age of 26 or so, Buckminster Fuller, the great Fuller futurist engineer, was his best friend. And Bucky is the one who coined the term Spaceship Earth. And I always think of Noguchi as the first true citizen of Spaceship Earth. Um, somebody who, who grew up and formed his entire mission uh, based on thinking about the planet as one community. Um, so just imagine when you look at this picture, imagine those eyes, bright, bright blue. Um, and that was important because it meant you know, there are times when he, he looked quite Japanese, but he could never be Japanese in Japan with blue eyes. And in the U.S., um, he'd never looked, you know, he was not Caucasian, obviously. He was half Caucasian. So he always looked in between. And his entire, again, life's work is about exploring the space in between, um, different identities, different ways of working. Um, it's just he, he sort of, for himself, um, took that as his other land, his other world. Um, Nathan, do you know how old he was in this picture? Yeah, I think he's, um, let's see, he would have been 18. Wow. Yeah, Incredible. and, and this, this is a funny, funny image. Um, there's another one uh, that's quite similar. Um, he, he was an apprentice briefly to Gutsan Borglum, who was for, he, he tutored Borglum's children a friend of his set him up with Borglum. Borglum is the sculptor of Mount Rushmore. So, uh, and, and Borglum ultimately told him um, that he looked at this teeny, very slim, wiry, little Japanese looking boy. Borglum was a virulent racist. Um, and Borglum told him that he would never be a sculptor. He should forget about it and just give it up now and move on to something else. Um, and of course, Noguchi spent, you know, the rest of his life proving Borglum wrong. Um, in some ways, but Borglum was important in the sense of Noguchi had Borglum sized ambitions for sculpture. Um, he wanted to make sculpture that was civic, um, that served a civic purpose, that was uh, important part of the mythology of, of uh, humanity, really, not just um, Americans, but humanity overall. And you can see that in him even there, you know, he, he had a sense of mission from very early on. Bacon, we'd love it if you could talk a little bit about some of the works in the exhibition Unfolding Noguchi at the Cameron Art Museum. Um, you know, for many of our visitors, this was their first experience with Noguchi. And so uh, I, I think 
in the curatorial work that you and our staff did with this exhibition, we tried to give an overview of the different types of work that he did because he was, he was quite varied throughout his career. So if you could just talk to us a little bit about the exhibition and the works that um, we have here in the slides, that would be wonderful. Sure. Yeah, I think what, what we, um, it, we talked about it for a long time and going back and forth, um, whether to do a very, very focused show, um, looking at one body of work and just make a, a, a strong single statement um, as Noguchi himself might have done um, if he were alive and, and were doing the show, like a recent body of work. But in the end, we decided that it made more sense given just his general unfamiliarity um, to make a kind of miniature retrospective um, and a kind of unruly index of all of the varied things that he did across his career. This is interesting that this piece in, that we're looking at right now is called Lida. Um, this is from mid-career. This is uh, the mid-1940s. And um, he's working here in Alabaster. Uh, and what, what's so amazing about this, this is a very good example of how Noguchi is, is really one of the first artists you know, he, he is the only artist to have come out of Brancusi's studio. Um, so he was a, in a studio assistant to Brancusi's. Brancusi didn't train anybody. He never had students and he didn't use assistants. But somehow Noguchi charmed his way into Brancusi's studio and ended up working as an assistant for him. Um, so he's got that. The, 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 Brancusi, in a way, is the progenitor of modernist formalism in the 20th century. You know, he is, he's the, the peak, the top, the pole. Um, and then uh, what most people don't know is that Brancusi, or Noguchi was very good friends with Marcel Duchamp. So when, when Noguchi saw this Brancusi show in New York City in 1926 at the Brummer Gallery, it just changed everything for him because he had been making those portraits and he had been working in an academic naturalist style and then he went and saw Brancusi and he realized that he had become the star of a totally passe art tradition <laughs> and he didn't want any part of it. He wanted the new, he wanted to be modern. Um, and so that's what took him to Paris, like everybody else who wanted to be an artist at the time, you know, Paris was the place to go. Um, but the, he got a tour of that Brancusi show in New York and the curator of that show was Duchamp. And Duchamp actually gave Noguchi a tour of the show. So Noguchi is one of the first figures who really combines the formal and the conceptual and pursues them both all the way through his career. This is a great example. So this is called Lida. This is, this is one of Noguchi's many rethinkings of a very traditional uh, artistic trope, both in painting and sculpture. Um, Lida generally being raped by a swan. You know, it's a terrible story, obviously. As, as so many mythological tales are, but uh, many painters and sculptors have taken advantage over the years of the incongruity of a swan and a human uh, woman together, um, connected, uh, you know, euphemistically connected in one way or another. Um, that's, it's just one of those subjects that because of the formal complexity of combining two figures, human and non-human, um, has, has been of a lot of interest. Noguchi's approach to it is totally different, utterly different. Um, he had made two Lidas earlier in his career, and they both look like sailboats that are arcing away from something, like under full sail. So it's like Lita sailing away from Zeus. And, she, he, and he turns Lita into a sailboat um, from, a, from a swan. That's a very Noguchi thing to do. Um, in a, and that's, that's in the late 20s. So it's kind of a, a early modernist art deco thing to do to turn her into sort of a fancy sailboat. Here, what he's done, and, and it's utterly remarkable because it, it's in the context of medical science, which he was obsessed with. We were just starting to understand the human genome at this time. And uh, medical science was starting to make huge advances. Um, electron mic microscopy was still a little bit a ways. But um, we were starting to look into the inner structure of our cells. And so what Noguchi has made here is, is both an abstraction of a kind of uh, Congress of sorts. So there, you can't see it here, but if we were over the top of it, these kind of bulbous projections almost join together in points. So you have the suggestion of, of connection. But, but my favorite way to interpret this is as a new cell and it's the new cell that's formed 
by the combination of divine and human DNA. So we're looking at the potential product of a union between Zeus and Leda in the form of like ectoplasm, you know, new genetic matter. Um, it's, a, it's a completely insane idea. It's very surrealist kind of in a way in that it's biomorphic um, and it's abstract, but it has Noguchi's way of looking at things. He, he always, Noguchi always maintained in his mind a very, very precise macro perspective and a micro perspective, the macrocosmic and the microscopic. And he's always flipping back and forth between the two. Um, and this, there's really no better example of that than, than Lita. Again, thank you. This is really interesting. This is from almost the same time. Um, so Noguchi uh, during World War II uh, lived in New York, so he was not subject to the war relocation authorities' orders under Executive Order 9066, which authorized the U.S. military to impose martial law in the Western United States with the, the purpose of rounding up and imprisoning ultimately 120,000 Americans of Japanese heritage in prison camps. Um, Noguchi wasn't subject to those orders as a resident of New York, but he had become friendly uh, in lobbying against the internment effort with the, the commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a man named John Collier in Washington, where he had gone to lobby repeatedly. Um, and, call, and once it was clear that internment was going to happen, at that time, it was still under, the camps were still thought to be under the authority of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And that's because in its infinite wisdom, when our government decided to intern all of these Americans, it looked for places that were isolated, large tracts of land that it already controlled. So where did they look? Of course, they went to Native American reservations, which are large, isolated plots of land totally under the control of the U.S. government. So many of the, the camps were established on, on Native American reservations. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs, before there was a bureaucracy to do internment, um, was in charge. And they were very progressive and idealistic. They were trying to right the wrongs that had been done. You know, I, I, that's in super mega air quotes. But the, the, the mission of the Bureau of Indian Affairs was to redress the evils that had been done to Native Americans. Um, so the notion was that Noguchi would go into one of the camps, the largest one in post in Arizona, and would redesign the camp and add, basically, he, he was viewing it the way Baron Haussmann viewed Paris in the late 19th century, which is a sort of a blank canvas to remake into a new society. And uh, so Noguchi went in with, with great plans for turning the camps into sort of a, a more ideal um, community. Um, better services, you know, swimming pools and playing fields and a zoo and a petting, gar a petting zoo and a botanical garden. And he even wanted to make a miniature golf course. He would have designed a miniature golf course. And it is, it is a true disaster that the world does not have a Sami Noguchi designed miniature golf course in it. Um, but in the end, uh, by the time he got there and by the time the camps opened, the government had established the War Relocation Authority which was under the War Department and had decided to run these camps as prison of war camps rather than as something else, um, something better, something slightly less terrible. Um, so he, he got no support in terms of remaking the camps. He was able to do a little, a few small things. By the way, the, the residents of the camps, the, the prisoners, excuse me, of the camps, um, ended up having to pay for and make all of the improvements and changes that they wanted in their camps themselves. And Noguchi participated in that at Poston um, and then tried to start getting out as quickly as he could. Um, but it took seven months in the end to get out. And he joked to the very end of his life because he was only released on temporary work pass um, that the government could call him back anytime it wanted, that he wasn't ever truly free. He was just on a temporary furlough from the prison camp. Um, this piece is called, that's sorry, that's a very long preamble. It's always necessary with Noguchi. So this piece is called My Arizona, and it is a direct um, reflection of uh, his time spent 
uh, so he was there in the summer, sadly. He, he entered in May. And uh, part of the, the difficulty of these camps, these prison camps, they were built very, very quickly by the army and in, then in some cases finished by the residents themselves. But they were just tar paper shacks. And uh, there in, in most of the places where they were, you have desert conditions. So it was freezing cold at night, drop below freezing, and could be 120 degrees in the day. Um, the food was atrocious. Um, Noguchi was sick the whole time. And he spent the entire summer just wandering the desert, basically turned it into a kind of a spirit journey, um, collecting materials, working on sort of make-do projects of his own. Um, this is a piece he made in New York immediately upon getting back to um, the city. And it's an abstraction you can see of a landscape. Um, you have the impression of intense heat. Um, and the notion with this, this plastic uh, square, um, which is in a way is a kind of shade, but is also a sort of lens uh, and a screen um, of the heat that sort of uh, just colors everything. You know, you can't see through it. Um, it's created this kind of shimmering haze. Um, you can see there's a little projection uh, in the bottom left uh, quadrant um, that's got a shadow. This isn't a great photograph. You don't get such a, a strong shadow, but the sort of sense of mirage and illusion. Um, we have a kind of schematic caldera of a volcano. We have a schematic pyramid. Um, you know, it, it looks a bit like a game board. Um, or the, the landscape of, of Arizona seen from above. And that way, it's, it's very Noguchi, the idea of, of schematizing a landscape. In a way, Noguchi saw everything as a landscape. Um, much later on, he said, we are the landscape of everything we know. He always talked about imaginary landscapes and spaces of the mind. So in a way, I think this, is, this was an attempt to essentialize everything he'd internalized from the desert landscape and put it into a single... Your 20 by 20 inch object, um, really, really neat, neat thing. Dakin, one of the most wonderful things about listening to you talk about Noguchi is how obvious it is that you love his work and you also love the man um, and you know so much about his life. Um, I wondered if you could tell us what draws you to Noguchi and what are you still learning? Um, as senior curator at the Noguchi Museum. Um, what, what, tell us about your journey with the artist. How do you explain love? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, it's, it's kind of amazing because I, I honestly didn't know the first thing about Noguchi when I started at the museum. Um, I, I had devoted my entire um, sort of learning career and, and uh, I was a museum administrator for 15 years before I went back to school. Um, that was a long time ago now. Um, but I had always focused on sculpture uh, and modern sculpture. So I had the kind of the grounding uh, to love Noguchi, but Noguchi is an, a sidebar to art history, always has been. And, and it's now what's making him so central because we're finally in a moment where everything that's been peripheral is moving to the center because we're finally recognizing you know, these incredible iniquities, both in the canon of art history, which is so dominated by macho white male um, mentality um, and stories. Um, and Noguchi is one of those people who's always been there, who is an alternative line through um, the 20th century. Um, but in terms of what, what attracts me personally, I mean, I, th I think it's, again, it's it, it, what he, again, he said his point of view or his perspective. Um, you know, he, he was a, a Moliarian um, kind of misanthrope. You know, he, he loved humanity, didn't have very much time for people, um, was, was impatient and impossible and brilliant. Um, he's, he's viewed as one of the great, I think I like everything about him that's contrary. He's viewed as one of the great collaborators of the 20th century because of his incredible working partnership with people like Bucky Fuller and Martha Graham. Um, but the way he collaborated with Martha was by not talking to her because they were both such impossible people. Um, all they did is make each other angry. So they just didn't talk and they didn't have to, it turned out to collaborate. But he, he writes 
extensively about what n such nonsense collaboration is. He thinks it doesn't actually exist between artists, that the best you can do is do the best that you can do. And if those things work together, great. And if they don't, you move on and do something else. Um, I just like, I like how, um, I like his, I guess at the end of the day, it's about values. Um, I'm a person who got into museums out of a sense of wanting to serve something larger, something more, um, you know, wanting, wanting to have a, a kind of spiritual working life. And I don't know why I found that in art, but I did. Um, and I think it just clicked so perfectly when I realized that Noguchi, um, you know, again, his entire mission for sculpture was to give it civic purpose and was to re just, and he realizes Noguchi's view um, is so uh, long. You know, he really thought in historic time, geologic time, cosmic time, he was not limiting his, his view to his own lifetime. Um, the story of, that's part of what's wonderful about sculpture. I always joke, sculpture is about civilization, painting is about culture. The working history of painting is 500 years. The working history of sculpture is a million years. You know, we have hand axes that are a million years old and sculptors you know, just think differently because of that, because the milestones of sculpture are laid out um, and, they, and it is the history of civilization. It's not that we didn't paint in the past, but for the most part, those things haven't survived. Whereas we have sculpture that has survived or what we call sculpture that has survived from multiple civilizations all over the earth um, going back 10,000 years. And Noguchi really takes full advantage of that. So I, I love that long view, that long perspective, and then putting it to work uh, for now and for the future, because Noguchi was all about whip stitching the past into the future. Um, he really was a deep believer in progress. Um, he was a utopian idealist um, in the 20s. Uh, for him, World War II, and especially the dropping of the atomic bombs was the end of that for a couple of decades. Um, he did come back around to his innate idealism. But I think that's what I really respond to is this incredible passionate idealism and a belief that he could make remake the world and make it better. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dakin. I think if I can get to the next image. Um, so this is a, a view of the installation at, at the Cameron. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the choices that uh, you and our team made when installing works at the museum. Well, it's a really nice space. Um, and you know we're we're so fortunate. When I visited, um, you have the Team Lab show, mm -hmm. uh, and so it it was a black box. Uh, it didn't look anything at all like this. Um, so I I was working from and, and looking at um, it former earlier installation photography, and um, and we were we we're so pleased to learn that it was okay to open up the skylights and you know brighten the whole thing up and have it be airy and open. Noguchi's work really wants to connect to the outside and its environment and feel like it's, it's part of a larger universe and the, your, your skylights do that really well. So the, the main goal was to, um, in, in, once I was able to, to really understand the space, um, we worked on creating a kind of miniature retrospective in the smaller, lower, narrower side of the galleries. And then to make kind of a big, impressive Akari-based installation in the full height side. Um, Akari is uh, a really interesting, complicated, but in, in a way probably the greatest of Noguchi's works overall. Not any one individual lantern, but the whole economy of Akari. Um, Akari are Noguchi's bamboo, pa washi paper, and metal lanterns. He started creating them in 1951. He designed new Akari lanterns every year of his life until he died in 1988. Um, they are made still in the same family factory in Gifu City, Japan, um, that he identified at that time. Um, and they still work with and, and for us making them. Um, every Akari lantern that's sold goes to support the activities of the museum. Um, they are remarkable things because each one is meant to be a kind of miniature sun. And um, what Noguchi realized, so the, the, the kind of innovation with Akari, um, these are traditional paper lanterns that Noguchi was the first person to suggest uh, putting electric light in. 
So it's taking this old craft tradition and doing what he called the true development of an old tradition. So he's taking a craft tradition and just updating it for the 20th century with electricity, of course, being the kind of the, the highlight of modernism um, or the, the main technological uh, innovation of the modern era and the modern world. Um, and by combining the two things, what he realized was if you pass electric light, even bulbs of the time, which were not, you know, not nearly as, we didn't have as much uh, control over the color temperature at the time, but if you pass them through washi paper, they look very natural. You turn electric light into something that feels like and acts like sunlight or moonlight, like natural light. So imagine each one of these as a, as a sun for the home. And he liked to say later that all you need to have a home is a, a mat on the floor and an Akari lantern. And they really are incredible that way in that they create whatever that magical aura is that we think of as home. Um, and they, they, they're incredibly diverse. And that's what we were trying to show in the, the installation. This particular one um, that, that uh, with your help, we were able to conserve. This is a one of a kind lamp that Noguchi made when he represented the United States at the 1986 Venice Biennale. It's called the 200D. Um, D is a style of lantern. Um, and 200 refers to how many millimeters it is across. So it's exactly two meters in diameter. And uh, it's held within this kind of odd open shrine-like structure um, because he was wanting to make it feel more environmental and spatial and give it a, a, a kind of a miniature universe to operate in. Um, and also to give it a kind of a ceremonial feeling and to point out in a way you can view it as a sort of pedestal um, Noguchi always talked about wanting to see beyond the, what he called the false horizon of the museum pedestal. In a way, this is kind of reorienting um, our vision to his idea of what the relationship between sculpture and obviously reorienting what a sculpture should be um, and its pedestal or the way of displaying it ought to be. And, and very appropriately, his exhibition for the U.S. Pavilion in 1986 was called What is Sculpture? Question um, mark. And, you know, at that point, he was 82. And uh, more than maybe any artist in American history, he'd earned the right to ask that question, what is sculpture? Um, by that point, Akari were phenomenally successful um, with multiple lines of floor lamps, table lamps, ceiling lamps. Um, and really, their their purpose was to make a Every one of them, if you buy one, you own a, a, a genuine Noguchi sculpture. And it also happens to be an incredibly useful thing that will, um, you know, again, create that, that magical aura in, in your house. I wanted to uh, look at the pictures of the conservation. And Anne, I wondered if you'd like to talk a little bit about um, why it was so important to us at the Cameron Art Museum uh, to help with the conservation of Akari 200D. We, unlike Noguchi, we, we enjoyed a true collaboration with Dakin and the Noguchi Foundation toward this end. Um, we very much desired it's such a beautiful work in our space. And yet, Dakin, you can chime in, it had been in storage for quite some time due to the incurring of damage, which we can see partially here. Yeah. And, um, I mean, one conversation leading to the next, um, it's my understanding, we just together said, well, what would it take to um, heal this work and liberate it so that it would be secure enough, conserved well enough to travel and that new audiences can enjoy it, not just for the exhibition here in Wilmington, but once our show closes here, that it would be strong and sure and true to be enjoyed by others. By that lantern, having spent time here and by our working with Dakin. And so we, we wanted to be, a, if, there, if possible, to be a part, play a little tiny part in that continuum. And so all of you there at the, at the foundation, you were so open to, every conversation you touched on the skylights do you have any idea how liberating that was for us to 
have your blessing, yes, let's open the lights. Let's open the skylights. So Dakin, perhaps you can, you worked much more closely on this decision, but it was a great honor to work with you on overall on this show, but particularly the conservation of this work for us. Well, we're, we're incredibly grateful. I mean, one, one of the very best reasons um, to have exhibitions is that they're an opportunity. I, I heard it sounds like you're doing an event going down through the basement and kind of doing the Indiana Jones um, in-house Indiana Jones thing, which is so much fun, you know, to go through the permanent collection and d discover, rediscover what's there. Uh, but often those things need some help. And um, one of the, the great things about doing shows is the opportunity to go back and, and do conservation on works that need it and to rehabilitate them and to get them back out into public where they belong. Um, this one, as you can see, so you can see on the left hand image some of the ripping in the washi paper. Um, and then you can see one, one amazing thing about washi paper is it is much stronger than typical laid paper. It's, it's mechanically very resilient. So you can expand it and contract it many, many, many times without it tearing, but it does dry and get brittle over time. Um, and you can see too, so when they made this lantern, it was the first time they had ever made something this large and they couldn't use their typical methodology for, for making the, the Akari lanterns, which is very, very thin, but complete stalks of bamboo. So they are round and they get bent and they, in every direction, they maintain all of their original strength because it's a tube. Here, they had to use strip bamboo. So this was bamboo that had been split like it would be in a, pair, a set of roller shades. And it's being bent in a single direction and it turned out that the bamboo's not as resilient this way. So over time, you can see anywhere in, on the right-hand image where you see something that looks like almost a right angle or or still somewhat obtuse, but still a sharp angle. That's a place where, and as it got tighter and tighter, as it came to the bottom of the spiral, as it had to tighten, it just broke repeatedly. So we had eight breaks in the ribbing down there. And when they break, then they tear the paper. So you had this whole kind of cascade of terrible effects. And also this lamp had just been around a long time. And as, as Ian said, it had, been, it had been taken, we'd had to take it out of circulation. We weren't able to use it. We weren't able to loan it um, because it was in such bad shape. And here in the middle, you see a picture. So this is our longtime objects conservator, Leslie Gatt, um, and she's inspecting it. And we had to hang it up just temporarily so she could get inside it. It looks like she's wearing a giant helmet um, and see just how bad it was. And uh, she did an analysis and we came up with a plan um, and with, with Cam's help, we were able to, to execute that plan. And as Ann said, now it's ready to go again. Um, and we're, we're really excited to get it back. We, we have, do have future plans for it because it is a, an incredibly important, dramatic thing. Um, you know, when, again, when Noguchi was planning what to do to represent the U.S. and his entire career at the Biennale, um, this is the biggest thing that he made. It's the kind of most important statement that he wanted to make. And in particularly, and this will tell you a lot about Noguchi, um, the one thing that everybody told him about the show and representing the United States was that he couldn't show Akari. Because at the time, we were still laboring under this delusion that art and commerce were separate. And that somehow like, um, you know, athletic purity in universities, it's just kind of this collective um, illusion. Um, you know, of course, the Venice Biennale was always a, a bazaar, a commercial bazaar. But um, everybody said that Akari was too commercial, that it, because it was a product line, that he just couldn't show any of them. And in true Noguchi style, he went off and designed an entirely new line of what he, that he called VB lanterns for Venice Biennale. He made 13 of them. Um, and then he made this lantern. And then when he designed his exhibition, there were 37 objects in his exhibition and 34 of them were Akari lanterns. <laughs> so that's, a, that's very typical Noguchi going his own way, had his own plan. But this was by far, uh, in a way, the most important object in the show. Because it really does ask that question, what is sculpture? What is sculpture for? How do we define it? And here, this is amazing because here, this is the other centerpiece of the exhibition. Um, so this was in the courtyard, if you've ever seen the American Pavilion uh, in Venice. 
it is uh, it looks like a, a Roman Palazzo style building. So it has two wings and a central uh, structure and then a courtyard between the wings. And um, Noguchi, this is a maquette for what is called slide mantra, which is a 10 foot tall, 80,000 pound white marble working slide. So it's a little bit hard to see, but the hole at the center, that is the entrance. And aha, look at this. So here we're seeing it from behind. So this is a stairway and you walk up the stairway, which spirals around and leads you up to the top of a slide. So it's like an 80,000 pound reified version of that kid's game, shoots and ladders. Um, and it's a continuous spiral. So uh, spiraling up and then spiraling down and up and down. Um, so this was the centerpiece of this play, piece of play equipment um, of his, his installation there in Venice. And the, it's very funny because um, people were so conditioned not to touch art that they couldn't get anybody to use it. And um, the, the consular official, the American consular official who'd been assigned to the show um, ended up having to seriously problem solve. He ended up paying tourists to slide down it so that the press could get photographs of people actually using it. Um, and there are lots of photographs of Noguchi and his friends going down it, but they also just wanted um, visitors to the vi Biennale. Um, they had to solve one other problem, which was that uh, because this, this slide just kind of dumps you in unceremoniously onto the ground, um, it can be quite uncomfortable to use. Um, it, by the way, now this is in Miami. If you're ever in Miami and you want to go see this object, um, it was sold to the city of Miami to be one of the centerpieces of a park, a, a bayfront park that Noguchi was redesigning for the city, an enormous uh, multi-acre project on the waterfront in Miami. Um, the, the slide is not far from the Perez Art Museum there. Um, but they, so they needed a soft landing area and the courtyard was hardscape. So they had to get something soft down and, and they settled on sawdust, but they could only find sawdust one place. And it was very, very fine. It was like dust and Noguchi hated it and it got all over your clothes, so it didn't work. So again, this consular official ended up having to uh, find a woodworking shop and they paid people, they got lumber and they paid like 15 or 20 people to just shave the lumber down on site all around the slide. So when you see the color photos of it, you see it's in the middle of this bed of what looked like just raw pine shavings. And that's exactly what it is because they paid people to make them right there so that you wouldn't land on your, your bum on the, the uh, pavers. So there's Noguchi just sitting in and amongst a, a nice range of Akari. Um, this is uh, in the, the studio apartment uh, in Long Island City, which is right across the street from the museum. And we still own the, the studio as well. And we're actually talking about um, restoring the studio uh, and restoring the apartment, which he's sitting in right now. It's a wonderful, remarkable structure that's a kind of a miniature version of what the museum would become. Um, you can see it looks like a Japanese interior, but it's actually a little prefabricated industrial building. Um, there are a hundred of them like that around us in Long Island City. He moved over there um, when he did in order to be close to his fabricators. So it's all little metal shops and stoneworking shops and mom and pop cabinetry makers, uh, light industry of, of lots of different kinds. And then he brought a friend over from Japan and they handmade a sort of somewhat he would call somewhat Japanese sleeping loft inside this little factory building. Um, so it's a kind of a perfect combination, just as the museum is, of an American factory aesthetic and some Japanese um, domestic architectural um, tropes, basically. That's that's a nice residence. You you see him in and amongst this range of Akari lanterns, and here we are in the middle of or underneath a kind of Akari cloud. Um, we call these uh, just putting a whole bunch of different models together, uh, pendant. This is is really nice. We can see a couple of other things um, in the middle of the cloud. The the tall blue 
sculpture and the shorter black sculpture, that's one piece called Black and Blue or Interior Landscape. Um, these are made of folded metal. Um, Noguchi did go to elementary school in Japan, so he learned kirigami, which is cutting of paper, and origami, folding paper. Um, and he, his whole life, he wanted to make a sculpture, three-dimensional sculpture out of two-dimensional materials. He loved sheet metal. It was like a magic act to create dimensionality out of flat materials. Um, he, he would joke later that it, it, it always felt like cheating to him because he had learned to carve stone from Brancusi. Um, so the idea of, of, again, sort of a magic trick um, seemed wrong, but he was totally compelled by it. So he kept doing it. And every decade he was trying to come up with a new body of work um, of, of flat work out of, uh, or dimensional work out of flat materials. This is really neat just because you get, again, the sort of references that Noguchi is making. We have a kind of a column and a kind of a table, um, but neither one is pure in any way. The table is not really meant to be used in this case. Sometimes they are, um, sometimes they're not. Um, and the column is a kind of, a, you can see it sort of arcing into the table, genuflecting to the table in, in a way. He always used two elements or, or more. He, one of his famous statements is that sculpture, if sculpture is the rock, then it is also the space in between multiple rocks and the relationship between those rocks and a viewer. And he's really more interested in the space than he was in the objects themselves. So, but he, but he realized that it took as few as two objects to be able to imply an entire environment around them. This is kind of interesting. This is a view. Um, so this is a brochure. It's the original brochure um, that was made in Gifu City to promote Akari Lanterns. Um, and on the left, we have a view of the studio that he made for himself in Kitakamakura, Japan. Um, so he, he went back to Japan for the first time in 1951, um, since he hadn't been there since 1931, and it was for the first time after the war. And he dived in, he met a lot of people, he was a kind of a, a minor celebrity, uh, was introduced widely, um, and, and met a famous cook and potter named Rosengine. And uh, Rosengine invited him to live on his property, um, gave him a farmhouse to use and, and live in. Um, then he, at about the same time, Noguchi got married. Um, in true, true crazy Noguchi fashion, he always um, met the kind of the right people at the right time and ingratiated himself in a way that made it possible for him to keep doing what he wanted to do. Um, so he had met a woman named um, Yoshiko Yamaguchi at a kimono exhibition in Brooklyn. And uh, I think they kind of hit it off but he didn't think much more of it. He was reintroduced to her when he went to Japan. Um, she went by Shirley as, a, as an English name, Shirley Yamaguchi. And um, then shortly thereafter, he was informed that he was gonna marry her. And um, she was the most famous movie star in Japan at the time, an incredibly complicated and interesting woman. She has seven names. Um, she's been the subject of a lot of scholarly interest. There was a symposium at Columbia last year there was a one week long symposium just about this woman, um, Yoshiko Yamaguchi, because she was ethnically Japanese, but she was born and raised in China. She was called the Matahari of Japan uh, because she was viewed as a double agent uh, by both sides, the Chinese and the Japanese. Um, then she became a movie star. Um, and then after she was a movie star, she actually became a very famous politician and then an incredibly successful political pundit she was like the Koki Roberts of Japan uh, in the last two decades of her life. Um, so she and Noguchi got married. Um, she was using Noguchi to get to Hollywood because she wanted to leave the relatively small Japanese, big fish, small pond, Japanese movie industry behind and make a splash in Hollywood. Noguchi had lots of friends in California um, and knew people in the, in the movie industry. So she was trying to use him to get to Hollywood, he was trying to use her to get to 19th century Japan. Um, he wanted her to wear uh, geita, traditional sandals. Uh, he made kimonos for her. There was a great article in Life Magazine from 1952 um, in which he explains that um, they both felt that she should have tighter fitting kimonos 
to flatter her amazing figure. So he made her kimonos with a side zip um, so that they could be body fitting. Um, hilarious, you know, hilarious uh, kind of detail. That's, that's Noguchi's approach to material culture, top to bottom. Um, so what we're seeing here is the back wall of the studio space that he made on Rose and Jean's farm. And it's just dug out of the hillside. So he did it himself by hand. Um, and you can see he's made a hearth and he's made kind of platforms uh, where things can be set. Um, and we're seeing it right now as a kind of a gallery for the Akari lanterns that he's working on. And some of these are models that went into production and have stayed in production. And some of them are prototypes that have sort of disappeared uh, from the world. But it's a, it's a neat insight into this uh, re-engagement with Jap Japan and Japanese culture and Japanese history, and especially its craft traditions uh, that he was so motivated by. Again, this is so wonderful. I'd like to open it up to questions. If anyone has a question, if you could just type your question into the chat box. I already have one question for you, Dagan. Um, Vic asked, um, what was Noguchi's favorite work? Did he have a favorite work? Not, not really. Um, you know, it, it's, you don't, it's hard to play favorites. I mean, Noguchi made thousands of things in his lifetime. Um, again, you know, that, that idea of being kind of suspicious of objects, which is a funny thing to say of an artist, uh, and particularly a sculptor. But I think, I think again, he was, he was proudest of his lifelong determination to find an alternative way to shape the, the planet, to sculpt the, the planet and the way that we live here. Because that's really what he was most interested in was sculpture as a means, a device for affecting the way, impacting the way that we uh, inhabit the planet. So I think that, that is what he would say was his finest or sort of point of pride. Um, and recently I've been saying, I don't answer that question either, but recently I've been saying that my favorite Noguchi um, is the incredible tree that now dominates the center of our garden. And if you haven't ever been to the museum, I would really encourage you to come the next time you're in or around New York City. But we have a beautiful Katsura tree that now its canopy covers almost the entirety of our two thirds of an acre um, of the garden. But when Noguchi planted that tree around 1980, it was shorter than he was and he was only five foot one tall. Um, so it was a teeny little quarter inch sapling because everything that was planted there, everything that, he's done, that was done at the museum was done with his own money and he was not rich. Um, so he, was, he was, um, had to be careful. Um, so all the plantings were new, small, basic, and that tree now has become this magnificent example. It's probably the best one in New York City now. That's so I, I, I love the idea of that as Noguchi's greatest sculpture because it's living. I love that too. So Peggy says, I just want to say thank you to Dakin. This was fascinating. And then Jamie asked, are there any good biographies about Noguchi that we can pick up if we want to learn more? So I just happen to have a copy of Listening to Stone, which is amazing, Jamie. And we're going to do um, a book club in August, August 6th. We're going to do a virtual book club. So pick it up and join us on August 6th. Um, and Jamie that's by also, Hayden Herrera. The yeah. author is Hayden Herrera, who is a, a, a superb biographer, um, who's very well known for her biographies of um, Frida Kahlo and Arshil Gorky as yeah. well. Yeah. Jamie also asks, what is the name of Noguchi's poet father? Oh, his name is Yonehiro Noguchi. Uh, went by Yone, Y-O-N-E, Noguchi. And Bobby says, what a marvelous talk. Thank you, Thank you Dakin. Does anybody else have a question for Dakin? Dakin, if, if I may ask, can you tell us about your funding source? What it is, and I, I, it is truly one of the most remarkable, not just museum experiences, but experiences I've ever had in my life going there. When it's safe to travel again, please. Um, and it's easy to get to, just jump on the subway up, up to Queens. Um, but all museums are struggling <laughs> with funding now. Can you help us understand a bit about your needs since you've got a new family here now? 
You know, we are so fortunate in that, um, you know, in, in his career, it always made things difficult for him that he didn't just do one thing. Um, he did m worked in multiple media and, and did all sorts of different projects, making sets and designing furniture and making spaces and working with architects as well as making sort of gallery sculpture. Um, but that diversity is, is what makes the museum strong now. So the museum is the very fortunate owner of all of Noguchi's intellectual property because the foundation, the Noguchi Foundation and the museum are one in the same entity. So we are the guardians of Noguchi's legacy and the, his legal heir and successor. So uh, we are in charge of the catalog raisonné of his work, um, which, which is run out of the museum. Um, we have the archives which I should say too, if you're interested in Noguchi, we've uh, just this past November, we launched um, a complete digital database of our entire archive, lock, stock and barrel. Everything is up online now. More than 60,000 photographs and documents representing something like half a million pages. And that was all done with the support of the Luce Foundation. Um, but our, so our, our revenue, our, our earned income is much more diverse than most museums. And Noguchi never did not want the museum to be an exhibition factory. So we've never become dependent on exhibition income. Um, and until very recently, we were viewed as so remote that our annual attendance, um, until just a few years ago, had never broken 30,000 for the year. 30,000 is one sort of medium busy day at MoMA or the Met. Um, so we, we are very, very lucky in that we, we've always also run a very tight ship. We're a small staff. We try to punch way above our weight, um, never gotten out over our skis. But we have the Akari income. We have the revenue from design licenses. Um, those aren't huge amounts, but when you combine them all together, they really mean that we have a kind of a third leg of the income stool that most museums don't have. And we're not super reliant on all of the forms of revenue that are based on attendance. Um, so we're, we're, in, we're very, very fortunate and we are weathering this insane period, um, I think, uh, more, uh, more easily than, than others for whom um, attendance is the, the beginning and end of it all. I'm so glad to hear that, Dakin. I have two more comments for you. John says, not a question, but my fellow docents and I all experienced the effect the show had on school groups when they entered the exhibit. It really calmed them down and they took it all in. And Barbara says, an amazing presentation conversation. Thanks so much. So if well, there- Well, thank you. We're, we're, we're so proud to have done this show with you. And um, we're only sorry that it's gotten caught in this weird whirlpool that we're all in at the yeah. moment. Um, and that not, not as many people maybe have had the chance to see it as, as would have otherwise, obviously. But um, we're still very, very grateful to have been able to bring it to you. Well, we're so grateful. Dagan, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such an honor. Um, such a great respite from the rest of the world to get to talk about Noguchi and his work. Um, Ali says, thanks for the presentation, greatly expanded my knowledge of Noguchi. I definitely recommend that everybody read Hayden Herrera's book, Listening to Stone. It's absolutely wonderful. And it's a thick book, but it's a quick read. It's really engaging. Um, and Noguchi's autobiography too, I would cool. highly recommend, which is back in print now. Um, it's from Steidel. Okay. And it's called Asama Noguchi, A Sculptor's World. And it's a Fantastic. great book. He, he wrote it. It's from 1968. Um, and it is just absolutely packed with Noguchi wisdom. Thank you. I didn't know about that. Thank you, Dakin. So if there are no other questions, I think that's it for our member Zoom today. Dakin, thanks so much for joining us. And it was so wonderful to see all of our members and docents and volunteers. Um, hi, there's Bobby. <laughs> to see you guys online. Um, this I can make this available online. I'll post it on Facebook. Maybe not today, but probably tomorrow morning. If anybody, uh, that's probably the best way to get it because it'll be a, a big file. But I can post it so you can view it. All we right. wish you the best. 
by the way, and good luck over the next oh, few months. You too, Dakin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody.